All right, everyone, it is officially 2.45 in the beginning of our final session, Lights, Camera, Action. And we would like to now turn the time over to Ben Nielsen and Erica Hill. Take it away, Ben and Erica. Okay, can everybody hear me? We sure can. Okay, great. And are you here too, Ben? I'm here. I can hear you. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, yep. we can. Just going to pop our videos on right here at the beginning so that everyone can see us and <laughs> know who we are. Um, and then we'll switch over to the slideshow in a second. And I'm just going to apologize for wearing, well, I'm not really sorry that I'm wearing a mask, but I'm not alone in this room. So I'm going <laughs> to wear a mask the whole time. Hopefully uh, it's understandable. Everything's fine. So I am Erica Hill. I'm the Community Relations Quarter Coordinator at the Provo City Library. And I wear a lot of hats here, but one of the things I do is manage our basement creative lab. And my present co-presenter is Ben Nielsen. You wanna tell us about yourself, Ben? I'm Ben Nielsen. I work for the BYU Library, um, managing the multimedia lab and the software training program there. And just as a disclaimer to everyone, here, I no longer run the studio space in the library. Um, so Erica and I gave this presentation um, a year ago at last fall conference, and we were going to give it again in the spring. Um, but the library has gone through a reorganization since then, and now Mike Hill is actually in charge of the studio and recording spaces. But I didn't want to throw him a presentation when he just got that, and, uh, and I still <laughs> know what's going on there. Um, but if you have questions about things happening currently, I probably don't know the answer to them, but I know about things in the past. Um, I do want to kind of get a, a feeling for um, who's here. So if we can enable the chat, I would love um, in the chat if you could put, if you're from an academic or a public library or a special library um, so that we can kind of make sure that we're hitting what's there. Let's see. Okay, We've got Linda from academic, Dan from academic, Scott from Spanish Fork Public, great. Mike's academic, Amy's academic. Public in Southern Utah, Logan Public. Okay, it looks like we're getting a good mix. It's, it's a pretty good mix. And yeah. so um, feel free to use that Q&A panel um, as, as we go along um, to let us know what specific questions. We've got a lot of things. There are a lot of things we could talk about. Um, and so we know the things that, that, <laughs> that would have been useful to us when we were starting out on this journey, but um, let us know. Yeah, and we do. Um, have representation from both academic and public. So hopefully we can get a good um, amount of information to everybody on their specific use case here. Um, yeah, so that's kind of us. And then I think we can um, move along here. Yeah. Uh, slideshow. Erica, it, did you want to show these pictures and then do the tour here? Um, I think I want to do the tour just in a few minutes, but we'll, we'll okay. show these pictures first. So the Basement Creative Lab at the Provo City Library mm -hmm. opened about two years ago. Um, and we had explored a lot of options before we settled on this one. Um, and one thing that I want you to think about in this presentation is that these ideas are really scalable. So there's a possibility in your library Maybe you have a space that you could turn into a full-fledged studio like the one I'm going to show you. But there's also a possibility that you have just a study room that you want to use occasionally. And all of those things are possibilities in your library. There, there are so many different um, ways you could go. Um, so we had a storage room that was used to store books for our used bookstore, but we decided it would be um, of better use to our patrons as a recording studio. Um, and I'm going to do the thing that people rarely do. I'm going to tell you how much it cost. Um, so to put everything together, it was about 150000 mm -hmm. in building costs. Um, we received a grant from the Provo City RAP um, tax 
for about $40,000. Startup equipment cost about $25,000 all in. We used a CLEF grant for a good chunk of it. And then our ongoing budget is about $5,000 a year in replacement costs and upgrade um, plus our staff costs. Um, and I know that that is, that those numbers are gonna sound like <laughs> unmanageable for a lot of libraries. But again, um, we're gonna talk through a bunch of options. You might have that in your library's budget, but we're gonna talk through ideas um, for even if your budget is smaller that you could make things happen for your patrons. So that's the basement lab. Ben, do you wanna talk about Oh, this is an example of uh, both a program that we did in the space, but also the kind of thing that's accomplishable in our studio. I'm going to try and make sure that this works here when I play it. Um, can that be heard? No. Oh, I think I did the screen share wrong, even though I practiced. Give me a second here. <laughs> I do apologize. If there was There's someone problem. Here about technology, then that would work out great. <clears throat> okay. I know you feel you feel a lot of pressure when you're doing a technological session. Like ah. it's a lot of pressure because I can't see anybody, hmm. um, so I can't see them smiling at me, telling me it will be okay. All right, here we go. And remember to make it full screen. That's right. Thank you. You know, it's funny. The day we met, we were both completely dressed up in our Sunday best. I worked at Dairy Queen as a 17-year-old, and I like to think that I made the best ice cream. I probably didn't, but I thought I did. I like playing with, with her Lego train. She has some trains. Everyone has a voice and a story. Come share yours at the Provo City Library. All right. Did you want to tell them anything about that video? Um, probably just while you're, I, I mean, I can just say that, um, <clears throat> that that's an example, like I said, both of something that can be made in this space, but also a program that we had. We did a family history thing where people could sign up for a time and then come. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> Sorry. I forgot my water bottle. Um, so anyway, that's the Basement Creative Lab in a nutshell. All right, perfect. Okay, so then um, telling you a little bit about what goes on at BYU here. And um, BYU, I don't have the exact numbers because I was not the person who created this production studio, but this is kind of a picture of it. It's not as nice and pristine as what Eric has got over there at the Provo Library, but it is a room with a green screen, blue screen, black screen, white screen, a, uh, a camera, and some um, more professional lighting setup and microphone. And... Um, so it's, it was done on a kind of a pilot basis and we're still waiting for the time when it's uh, taken and kind of given the full treatment that we hope it will be given some time. So we've got that space that students as uh, faculty and staff can use. And then we also have sound booths. <coughs> we have two, uh, two sound booths that are operating right now. And this shows the, our sound booth and our mini sound booth. Um, and, but we've actually now, since we first put this presentation together, replaced the mini sound booth with actually an expanded recording <coughs> booth. Um, the recording booth has, instead of just one microphone, it has two microphones and it also has a piano in it and some extra instrument inputs so that people could actually bring in um, some of their instruments, maybe a small band and be able to do something there. So we have uh, kind of both the video and the audio options there. Um, and we found at BYU that these get used a lot, especially the, um, the audio recording options get used all the time. And they actually serve, save patrons a lot of money. So I don't have the details on 
how much we spent on each and everything, but I do know that we've saved um, students during the 18 to 19 school year. Um, we estimate that we, the production studio saved students about $200,000 in costs, the sound booths about $100,000. And then we also do equipment checkout, um, lending of cameras and lights and that kind of thing. And equipment checkout saves students around $800,000 um, during the 18 to 19 school year. So it is um, pretty significant and people do love to use it. I'm going to stop share because I think this is where Eric is going to yeah. show us around. So let's see, we'll make sure, can we still see us? Yeah, so I figured because this is virtual, um, we could actually show you the space a little bit more. Um, we have it set up right now during COVID. We've been doing um, virtual story times. So that's our setup right now. Um, but I actually did want to show, let's see if we pan over here, can see um, Ben mentioned that, um, that their audio gets a lot of use. And actually when we were open to the public, um, this is our sound booth and it by far and away gets the most use. Um, most people who have been using it in the two years that we've been open seem to have more use for um, the audio facility. So whether they're recording audiobooks or podcasts or music, um, that seems to be the thing that gets the most use. Um, but we do have the space that, that people can do more. Um, so we have multiple cameras, a uh, bunch of different kind of lights. Um, some require sort of extra training and some people can use right away. Um, we have acoustic paneling on the walls, shag carpet on the floor. That, they're just rugs, they can be pulled up. Um, and so it's been used, I wouldn't say it's in constant use, um, but it's definitely it's definitely been useful um, for some of our patrons. So this is our space, yay, there it is. So I think, I don't know, is there anything else anybody wants to see in our space? If so, we can always go back to it. We'll try and leave quite a bit of time there at the end. I'm going to try sharing my screen again and hopefully this time without the menu bar in place. Um, I don't have a way to know if the menu bar is showing or not, but I'd be told that it was showing last time. So hopefully it's not showing now. I don't see anything. Um, let me know if it is. Try Okay, perfect. So that's creating. And then Except we can see your chat. We can now. see your chat. So sorry. Right <laughs> it's so weird. Um, I, that's because I clicked, I'm doing the full share because I think that's how what we found made the menu bar not show up. So then it will show you the chat, which is cool. Um, okay. So the first question, we really want this to be applicable to you, to what you, um, your library and your situation. Of course, we can't know what all of those are, but I, I think it's good for you to consider some things right now thinking about it. And um, the first one is what space? What space do you have available to you? Neither of these, um, neither of these studios, new construction, right? They weren't built. Now there was a lot of renovation that was done at Provo and some minor renovations that were done at BYU, but they used existing space that wasn't um, being as used previously, right? And so you want to think about your library and think about what space is there right now that we could potentially use this for without incurring some huge cost. Unless of course you already have a space. So think about that. Um, and then go over here. And the next question is really um, what equipment are you going to use in your space? Um, so Erica can talk a little bit more about 
about equipment because uh, she's done the purchasing of that more recently and has more um, more details on that. But I think it's really important to know, like, don't get hung up on equipment, right? Don't get hung up thinking like we need the best equipment or we'll never be able to afford equipment because equipment comes at all different price points and um, in all different um, amounts of experience needed to operate it. Absolutely. And um, I'm in the questions at the end, if you want to get into more specific equipment, um, I can give specific things. Just know that half of the things we recommend, sometimes the new version is going to be released in like a month. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to think about guiding principles. Um, so one of the things to think about as you're thinking about what equipment to buy is where your library fits in the cycle of creating a media project. So there's, there's pre-production. Um, so what happens before a project gets made? The equipment doesn't have much of a role to play here. Though library programs could. Are you interested in giving a class on screenwriting? Are you interested in giving a class on making a documentary? Um, programs are there, um, but that phase is not particularly equipment heavy. Then there's the production. Um, and it's the most equipment and skill intensive. If you want to focus this as, if you want to focus on this phase as a library, you need to seriously consider not just having equipment, but also having dedicated and at least semi-knowledgeable staff. Um, because this is, this is the phase where a lot of people get hung up, um, that there are barriers to entry. Um, and so thinking about what is most useful for your patrons, what do they want, and how can you help them accomplish their goals. Um, and then the last is post-production. So editing a project, taking it from, okay, I filmed the thing, and now I want it on, man, people barely even use DVDs anymore, but I want it on a DVD or a flash drive, I want to put it on YouTube, I want to um, give it to my grandma or something. Um, and this can be accomplished basically with a dedicated computer. So you may find that people, um, maybe they don't need a fancy, uh, they don't need a fancy camera, they don't need a nicer camera. They're fine with filming something on their phone, but they need that software to take them <clears throat> from this thing exists on my phone to this thing exists in uh, a product that I can give somebody. Um, and then just really basic recommendations. Um, if you're thinking about lighting, we probably recommend going LED. They last longer. They're a little bit more um, durable than my, I have my, my lighting guy here. And so he is, yep, okay, great. Um, they've gotten a lot better in the last few years. Um, with cameras, a DSLR camera will be your most versatile. Camcorders are a little more user friendly. So it just depends where you want to go there. Um, you probably need some microphones. One of the things that we often don't think about <clears throat> is that sometimes the difference between a video that we see, view as very amateur to one that we view as more polished actually has very little to do with what we see and everything to do with what we hear. So investing in a good microphone um, is a great idea. And then some kind of backdrop. Um, here we have gray walls, black curtains, and then a variety of other backdrops we can put up. At BYU, you saw that they had a bunch of curtains on a track. Um, so there are just things to consider. Uh, do you want painted walls? Do you want backdrops on frames or on a track? Um, I think black and white and gray are your most versatile. A lot of people think, oh, a green screen. But green screens are kind of not as, uh, I don't, our green screen does not get used very often. Would you say, Colton? Our green screen's not used very often people are more interested in kind of a plain or neutral backdrop usually. <clears throat> so sorry, there's my, there's my also, rundown on equipment. Yeah, sorry, I was just saying our green screen also very, um, very rarely was seeing much in the way of <laughs> Now our, our tie-dye screen on the other hand, very popular. Hmm. That's actually not true. I, I don't actually. <laughs> 
appetite ice cream. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, you know, depending on your, your patron use. Um, yeah, so uh, just to summarize that before we move on, you really want to think about kind of in categories, like what are we going to do for lights? What are we going to do for filming? And what are we going to do for audio? And like we were saying, audio seems to actually get used more. And so um, investing in something that can give people good audio can make a huge difference without being a huge expense to your library. All right, now we want to talk about usage and who gets to use the service um, and how long do they get to use it for? And these are all questions that you have to answer when you think about bringing a service like this to your library, because what you'll find is um, sometimes everybody wants to use the service and maybe they are your patrons um, from the base that you serve and maybe they're not the patrons from the base that you serve and you have to decide if they're going to be able to use it. And maybe they want to use it um, all day and uh, but everybody wants to use it that day. And so you have to decide how long is it going to be used for. And so there, you do need some policies in place and deciding who's going to be able to use it and how they're going to use it. Are they restricted in what they're able to use it for? Um, those kinds of things. So at BYU, um, it's fairly simple. You have to be a BYU student, staff, or faculty member in order to use the studio. We don't serve um, community patrons in that way. During the pandemic, community patrons aren't actually allowed on campus at all, but um, even during regular times, uh, community patrons aren't allowed to use the recording services because the demand from our core patron base is just too high for that. And so then we also, in order to allow more people to use it, we limit them to two hour blocks. Um, so they can reserve two hours a day um, through our reservation system and that's all that they can use on a single day. And that's just to try and let as many people use the service as possible. So um, for Provo the, in the public sector, probably our most controversial decisions um, have to do with who can use it because we decided to limit it to Provo residents, which means that that doesn't even include, like if you buy a non-resident card, you still do not have access to the studio or we have a reciprocal borrowing agreement with Orem um, that typically gets people materials, um, but Orem residents also uh, can't use the studio. We wanted to do that first as a way of protecting the investment from the Provo taxpayers um, and to see what kind of demand it had. And then see, so after two years of use, um, we're reevaluating that um, just to see, um, because I think that um, it's interesting in an academic setting, I think that their spaces get used a ton because students are getting having assignments, they're doing things. Our usage, it's not in constant use. Um, there's, we have our regulars who come in and every month we seem to add a few more, a few more, a few more, um, <clears throat> but we have not been at capacity. And so that's something that we are um, reevaluating. So I think the next question is, when can people use it? And for us, that answer was during the open hours of the library. Right now it's weird, COVID's weird, we're closed. Um, we're closed right now. Not our library, but the basement lab. Um, it's challenging to social distance in here. We were worried about sanitizing equipment and different things like that and also um, and we can talk about this more if people are interested, but we are using the studio almost constantly. Well, fairly regularly, I should say, um, for virtual programming that we've been doing from the library during the pandemic. Um, but typically it's open when the library's open as long as we can get staff here to do it, to be here. Yes, and then for um, BYU, <laughs> changed somewhat in, in when people can use it. It used to be eight o'clock in the morning till 11 o'clock. We're running on reduced um, staff hours during the pandemic right now. So it's, um, it's really running 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. right now. And then we don't have it um, available. We don't have the studio available on Saturdays. We do have the sound booths available on Saturdays. So, um, so we've had to make a few changes here and there, but mostly it's open most of the day and they're able to make their reservations through an online system. We use um, LibCal's online system. 
So if you um, are a SpringShare subscriber, you can actually look into adding their equipment booking module onto your current subscription and using that for this kind of thing. All right. Let's see. So dealing with risks, this is the fun one. And this might be where people have some questions um, because whenever you add a new service to your library, there's going to be a certain amount of risk involved and some services have um, more risk than others. And I'd say a studio is one of those things that comes with, you know, a fairly significant amount of risk because of the investment that can be made. If you choose to make a large investment into equipment, then there's risk there. And especially if you choose to let that equipment leave the library, then there is also risk there. And so, um, so this next section is all about how we, how we deal with that. Yes. So one of the, <clears throat> one of the, actually, before we get to damaged equipment, um, probably our, one of our patrons least favorite decisions that we made <clears throat> is that in order to use the studio, you have to take a class and we call it the how not to break things class. Um, but basically it's an hour. We teach it multiple times a month. Um, we keep our class sizes small. We limit it to 15. Usually we don't have that many people come. Usually it's more in the two to 10 range. Um, but they come, we give them hands-on experience with a camera, with an audio recorder and with some lights while our technicians are here. Um, to answer questions for them. And that's just the sort of minimum barrier to entry. It doesn't matter how experienced someone is. They could be a professional. If they want to use the space, they, also, they still have to come to the class. <clears throat> and that has definitely, I think, limited some of the people. I think there are people for whom that bar is too high. They, just, they don't want to give an hour of their time some weeknight. Um, but I also credit that class for being the reason that so far we've been open two years and we have had an HDMI cable and a love mic clip broken. Um, nothing else is broken. And I think a good part of that is the sort of weeding out and then education that comes in that class. Yes, and we at uh at BYU, we've not required any kind of training before using it. And we don't have just anybody from the public, like they have to be affiliated with BYU. So it's a little bit different there, but, but we've had more, more damage than Provo has. So all of the pictures currently on the screen recommend things that, um, that have been broken during the time that I was managing the studio. So curtains have been ripped, cameras have fallen over and had parts busted on them. Um, lights have shattered when people um, didn't use them in the proper way. So, um, so training and having a barrier to entry definitely probably mitigates some of the damage that comes along um, from patrons using it. But of course you have to balance that against, um, against barrier to entry and also mm -hmm. staff time used for that training. Um, probably one of the one of the other I think differences in our spaces, Ben, is that we have anytime somebody is using the lab, we have a lab tech here. We have sort of a lobby entrance area with then closed circuit cameras, so they can see what's happening. So they're here all the time if somebody's in the staff or if somebody's in the studio. Um, and at BYU, it's a little more <laughs> okay. Go in and. <laughs> Don't break things, please. Yeah, because of um, just taking, just kind of taking an empty space to create the studio in, um, it turns out that the studio is actually located basically across the floor um, with, from my staff. And so we do have a security camera in there, but there is not constant monitoring by staff there. And I think that um, from reviewing security camera footage, that sometimes results in people maybe doing things that they wouldn't do otherwise <laughs> if they were being watched. People would never, they would never, <laughs> they would never. So there, I mean, that, that brings up a good point um, that before we get to terms and conditions is that you have just, you put a service out there and you don't know what it will be used for. Um, 
because people are creative and we're trying to inspire creativity with these types of services. And so you just don't know what it's going to be used for and people will surprise you um, in what they, what they choose to do. And then you might have to revise your rules or your terms and conditions based on what people choose to do so that you can mitigate some of that. Um, I, we do have terms and conditions at BYU. They agree to it when they make their reservation. And I do recommend that if you are going to have a studio space, you have some kind of terms and conditions um, that tells people what's expected, what they're not allowed to do, and um, what will happen if they break the rules so that it's, it's upfront and it's clear, even if they choose not to read them, which tends to almost always be the case in that they don't read them, but it gives you a recourse if you need it. Um, so from the public library standpoint, um, with one of our terms and conditions is that we charge full repair or replacement cost for broken equipment. Um, so far, we haven't really, we didn't charge anybody for the HDMI cable or the lav clip because we didn't feel a need to. Um, we have, we do have a small circulating collection also. Most of our equipment stays in the studio. People can't check out our Blackmagic cameras and take them <clears throat> outside the library. Um, but we do have a collection of GoPros and an audio recorder and soon we'll have a DSLR kit <clears throat> that people can take out. And we have had some of those broken. Um, and we, we try and work with people, but, um, but that is our policy is we charge them the full repair or replacement cost. If we feel like it was their negligence. Um, we did have a situation where <clears throat> somebody, we had a GoPro camera that we sent out for repair and got it back from the repair place. And then the next time that it was checked out, somebody, they verified with us. I said, okay, just making sure like this is a GoPro, it can go underwater, right? And we said, yep, it can. And, um, but when they brought it back, it had stopped working and wasn't working anymore. And we looked into tons of causes and figured that probably what had happened is that the people who repaired it probably didn't fully uh, repair the waterproof seal. So we decided that wasn't their fault. So we didn't charge them for it, even though it happened while they had it. So, you know, there's, there's always that give and take, especially in a public library space where you, you don't want to cause undue financial burden on anybody, but you also want to protect your equipment. Yeah, and I think that's really the point is that like the, <laughs> the resource needs to be protected. Um, and you can, you can always choose not to charge somebody like Erica was saying, like, but you can't choose to charge someone if you didn't tell them they could get charged to begin with, right? So you can't, <laughs> the other way. so it's better to put it up front. At BYU, um, BYU has very comprehensive insurance over all of its equipment. And so we're able, we only charge students $100 for broken equipment that is returned. If equipment never comes back, then they can be charged for the full price. Um, but um, do $100 because that's the deductible on the insurance. And then we file an insurance claim for the rest if it's broken. So that's probably it for terms and conditions. And I think that's it for the prepared presentation here. I'm just gonna stop the share and go back to my video. <clears throat> so you can at least put a little bit of a face to who's talking to you. Sure. I don't know if there's anybody left in here or if they've all gone away. <laughs> I feel so, some people here. How nice of them you know, to stay around. That's, that's um, but we would love to open this up for um, Q and A then so that we can actually answer questions that you might have um, maybe on a more practical level than just seeing like what we did. Um, I'm going to start with a question that you might have, which is, should my library do this? And the answer I think is yes, probably. <laughs> um, I think you, you need to gauge um, your interest. So we had done before we made this decision, we'd done several community surveys and asked people sort of to prioritize their, um, their where, where they thought we should spend our technology money. 
Um, <clears throat> we gave some options like, do you want more computers? Do you want additional training? Do you want capability, like audio video capabilities? And this was far and away the winner <laughs> in, in that survey of things, new library services that people were interested in. Um, but your community may not feel that way. Um, oh, question, what are some of the ex most exciting presentations you've seen come out of your lab? That's an interesting one. Um, so anyway, yeah, think, think about the first thing to think is, is this something your patrons really want? Um, let me, Ben, do you have a good answer for that? What are some of the most exciting things that you've seen come out of your lab? I think that is a great question, Colleen, and um, and it's something that I would like the answer to, and I've tried to get the answer to um, a number of times to get people to actually share with us what they are producing, and uh, and that that's actually proved quite difficult for us, which I didn't think originally it would prove difficult to get them to like share it, but we actually held a whole contest um, last year where we were like giving away um, a pair of Beats headphones and trying to get people to just share what they were using our resources to produce. And we got almost no response. Um, so I don't really have a great answer. Um, I know people have produced, they come in, they use the stuff, but they don't share it with me. <laughs> that, that, it turns out that's actually very, that's very true for us as well. Um, I don't know that I've, that I've seen <laughs> anything that, people have made. There's a podcast uh, called The Scars We Share. Hmm. It's got a few episodes and quite a few subscribers. So we've got some successful podcasts coming out. For us, I think sort of the, the mark of success is the people who keep coming back to use it. We have people who have been using the space, goodness, almost the whole time. Um, so we've been open for two years and we have and what that says to me is that we are serving a need. Um, when someone comes in and just uses it once, like maybe we were there for them in that one moment, but when somebody keeps coming back, it means that this is still relevant for them and that's really exciting to see. <laughs> I think, I actually feel like maybe I can answer this, the BYU Old Spice ads. It's the, it's the marketing team. Right, that does those best. So, um, yeah, so, so the Old Spice ad and, and all of our ads are made <laughs> by our unit and they, they have their own, um, their own resources, but that is actually um, now Mike Hill is who's over that and he's the one who is now over the studios. Um, we made that change in the spring. So that's why I, I'm not over the studios anymore because my job as far as like training people on creative software is expanding. And so Mike's taken the studios under him um, to see that. So it, it, it's, it's not really using the same resources, um, but that was a, a great viral video for sure. And we do have a great team that produces um, a lot of good videos. I think um, back quick back on Colleen's question about what is cool that it's produced. I, I think you are more likely to hear about the podcasts that are produced because people are less self-conscious. People are very still self-conscious about their voice, but they're less self-conscious about their voice than they are about um, themselves and their voice all being out there at the same time, right? And, um, and we don't necessarily see amazing things being produced. Um, that doesn't mean they aren't, but that also probably means that we're fulfilling a need at the, um, at the beginning of the learning curve. Right. Um, what what you're doing as a library is allowing people resources to things that they wouldn't have otherwise. And so if it's their first time using a camera, it's probably not going to be something that's like out of this world. Right. But they have to use that camera the first time before they decide to invest themselves in a camera to make their own YouTube channel or something like that. Um, so let's see. Looks like we have another question here. Um, uh, could you read the question out loud? Yeah. Yeah. 
It says, Ben, I know you said you aren't over the studios now, but do you know if students or faculty are using the recording spaces to complete online classes and lectures right now? Um, I do not know if, if um, students are using it to produce things. Um, we, uh, we originally, when the pandemic started, um, closed the studio completely and just kept it open um, for faculty who called us to rec if they needed to record lectures. And we got very, very little use from that. Most faculty just wanted to um, put their webcam up and talk to it rather than come in and record it. Um, but there are faculty that do ongoing series um, using our, um, we've used our production studio. So um, I think his name is Anthony Sweat, um, does a series. Um, he's a religion professor at BYU and he's used our studio for some of those videos. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know that it, that they've done things specifically related to the pandemic in there. Again, I'm not talking to them every day like I used to. So, sorry, that's not a very great answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> um, something I did also want to point out, um, if, you're, if you're thinking about introducing some kind of capabilities at your library, um, it might be good to think about video services <clears throat> as kind of the difference between do you want to to use another sort of popular library of things analogy do you want to circulate a cake pan library so where you give people tools to do things or do you want to bring in a presenter to teach them how to decorate a cake um, so at your library you might decide that you don't want to do the cake pan library you don't want to have a studio you don't want to have a sound booth you don't want to do that, but that doesn't mean that you can't still bring somebody in to give people tools and to teach people skills um, that they can use to do things themselves. Um, a popular program we had before um, everything shut down, um, we had a filmmaking class for kids and over time that class sort of morphed into a stop motion animation class because that seemed to be what the kids were most interested in. But that class used very basic equipment. It was all iPads. Do we even have microphones? I don't think so. It was all iPad based. And so there's a possibility that your investment into giving people uh, tools and skills might be the price of two iPads um, and making stop motion animation or something like that, um, or you could invest in the physical space and the equipment that people uh, either can't or won't get on their own. Yeah, and I think that that is, it's really important <laughs> to consider what you are able to do, right? And it can be very intimidating. I'm wondering if anybody has questions about equipment, like cameras, lights, those kinds of things. If we brushed over those too quick, we do have a handout, um, which I think they will be sending out that, um, that goes over some of Erica's recommendations for that. But um, I know that when I first, I don't have a, a professional like video background, um, I have a professional instructional design background. And so when I first came into this world of cameras, it's, it can be very intimidating because camera people like to try to be really exclusive, like by throwing like a lot of numbers in things. <laughs> and that can make you feel like you're in math class, um, which can make you feel unsettled. Um, and I just <laughs> want you all to know, like you could reach out to me for help. Um, I, like I said, I don't have a professional video background, so I don't even understand everything but um, that always goes on, but I've learned a lot over the years about what the different numbers mean. And a lot of the numbers aren't actually important to what you are, to what you're trying to do, right? They might be important to some people, but they aren't really important to what you're trying to do. So if you like start looking at things and it's like, this is 50 millimeters on a micro four thirds lens. And you're like, that is really, that's really confusing. Like just take a step back and be like, oh, like an iPad is a simple thing, right? You just swipe open the camera and you can start taking a picture. You don't have to deal with any numbers at all. Um, one thing. Right, there may not be any questions. <laughs> one more question, yeah. Um, something that I will say that I, I wasn't sure how to put this in, but I will say that having this space
has been amazing in our quick pivot to doing virtual programming um, at the library. We are, so we are no longer doing in-person story times. We haven't done them since March. Um, but we've basically been producing a weekly television show <laughs> is what it comes down to. Um, but in all of our trying to get our bearings and figure out what was going to happen, never did we have to have the conversation of, oh, can we do this? <laughs> like, do we know how to do this? Because we know how to do this. Um, and we already had a lot of tools in place um, to make that to make that really possible. Um, so that's been of great use to the library. We're serving patrons differently than we originally anticipated. Um, but it's, it's been really interesting. I don't know what other libraries' experience with virtual programs um, has been, but we have found that some of our virtual programs are way more popular <laughs> than their in-person counterparts. Um, so it's, it's been interesting to think what things are going to change forever. Like it turns out people like to attend. We had a class on Instant Pots last week, um, using your Instant Pot, all these things. And we've had that class before, and we had probably 20 to 30 people come. So that's a pretty good turnout for a library program, I would think. But we had 70 people on our Zoom call, um, which means that maybe people like not having to get a babysitter to learn how to use their Instant Pot or bring their kid along or, 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 or. Um, so it's been, it's been really great. We don't use the studio for every virtual program. Um, but we've done a paint night in here. We do our story time stuff. We did ukulele classes for a while. Um, so it's been really, it's been really fun to see what we can still do, even in times when we've been closed. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's great. Um, and it, it just goes to show that like, you know, you don't know what's going to happen or how things might be used in the future and um, having resources is always good. And it's always what a library has been about, right? Like a lot of the resources used to be print, but we're moving into a different phase of, of, um, of existence now, especially in this pandemic. And so, so many more of our tools are digital and providing not only the tools for information consumption, but information creation, I think is going to become increasingly more important in libraries um, as we go along. So I'm not seeing any more questions come in. I'm wondering if we can open up the chat again. And I just want to ask um, those of you who are here just to um, give me one word in the chat when it opens up here um, that tells me how you're feeling about library studios right now. Nobody has any. Nobody has any feelings. <laughs> <laughs> and these could. This could be like nervous. This could be like excited. Um, Linda's speechless. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> could go either this way on that. In the most amazing presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, Colleen is saying awesome. Debbie's optimistic. interested that's great Leanna is saying it's, it's awesome Leanna is my former supervisor <laughs> <laughs> so so we will uh, we will we will think that that is a very good information there I'm assuming that's Leanna who is my former supervisor there are multiple people with that name great great awesome yeah the price point the I think that's probably honestly for for a library interested in getting into it. Um, the the initial investment is probably the biggest hiccup, um, both from a staffing perspective and just equipment, um, because you can spend you can spend a ton of money on equipment. But you also kind of feel like, well, now who's going to run this? I have two dedicated staff, part-time staff members that they, they split up hours and things to make things happen. Um, yes, we, 
uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think. We may have used our LSTA money for something else. But we definitely used grant money <laughs> to, to make things happen. Um, but yeah, LSTA money is a great, a great way to get started. Um, and, you know, talking about risks and rewards, I know, who was I talking to? Someone at Payson? <clears throat> Payson Library, they have a really robust library of things. They rent kayaks. They, um, they have a couple DSLR kits. They have some audio recorders, um, you know, lots of stuff like that. And I know in addition to the equipment here, like we check out telescopes, we do things, um, and, uh, and so I think if you're nervous about things, you can start smaller. Our GoPro kits, um, I want to say the investment in those um, to get the camera and some accessories, it's something in the realm of $600 all in. Um, so you could start with one and then build up. Yeah, and that's that's what I would say on on the price thing. Being pricey, it's expensive to do a studio, right? But there are ways to find out if it's going to be useful by just starting out by like checking out some equipment or something, right? Maybe you can only get together like a thousand dollars, and you use that thousand dollars to buy one DSLR, one shotgun mic, and maybe a light, um, and then you see, then you advertise that you have that, and you see if you accumulate a huge waiting list for that, um, which you're likely to do. Um, I know that Springville Library has a, a small drone. They actually have, I think, two drone kits. And I was like, when I, because that's where I live, when I got on the holds list for that, I was like 60th person in line for it. Um, and so, uh, so you put it out there and see what you, what you start to get. The other thing I would say is that um, people are, people can be intimidated by, um, buy it right and they feel like they don't have the equipment they actually probably do most people have really excellent cameras in their pocket all the time but they just need somebody to tell them that it's okay so maybe all you do is like get a tripod and a phone mount and then you tell people and then you have like a class that tells people how to get the most out of filming from their phone mm -hmm. I don't even really need to know that much about filming but they feel better for having done that right I often think that like when you have equipment, you feel like you have permission to do something that you felt like you didn't have permission to do, to do before. And um, a good example from my own life is I used to go, when I lived in Provo, I used to go climb on the bouldering wall in the Provo Rec Center like every day. And, um, and I would climb in my tennis shoes and I felt like I wasn't supposed to be there. Um, and then I bought climbing shoes and suddenly I felt like I had permission to go <laughs> Like I had, because I had the equipment and it didn't even necessarily mean that I knew how to use the equipment, but because I had it, I felt like I had permission to use it. Right. That's a lot of what you're giving people is maybe even more mental than physical, right? Saying like, yeah, this is available to you. And they say, well, if it's available to me, then I must be allowed to do it. That's a great, that's a great point. Good analogy, Ben. Right. E. Do we have we may any? have wrapped up all the questions. And uh, I'm going to just share my screen so that we can get our contact info up here. Mm. And hopefully, well, I probably did that wrong, but I think you'll still be able to see it. There we go. If people can't see it, let me know. Yeah, we can still see it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so there's our contact info. Um, I won't speak for Erica, but please feel free to contact me with uh, questions or concerns or um, to bounce ideas off of. I love to do this. I love to see um, these services expand to more people. You can definitely contact me as well. <laughs> so now we're just here. <laughs> <laughs> now we're just going to sit here. I believe this is the end of the conference. Yeah, it just flew by, didn't it? Yeah, it's been quite excellent, though. Well, Erica and Ben, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate all of your expertise and your time that you spent with us today. 
Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate Thank you both. Great yeah. Thanks for a great presentation. And to our attendees, thank you so much for joining us for the ULA Fall Workshop. And we look forward to seeing you at the next one.